Today I'm going to do a video on some tools or things that I feel like uh, every fountain pen user or collector um, should own. Um, first off, I want to start and say, you know, excuse me if I end up coughing a bit in this video. Uh, I've been sick for the past week or so, which is why I haven't really put up anything. <coughs> oh, excuse me. And uh, my throat's kind of raw from all the coughing. Um, but anyway, uh, first off, um, what I think is one of the most important things that any fountain pen user should have is some sort of magnification, uh, whether that be a magnifying glass or um, a microscope or like a, just a basic triplet loop or whatever you can get. Uh, it doesn't have to be overly expensive. You don't have to go crazy with uh, some of the loops that you know geologists or people who examine examine uh, examine gemstones use. Uh, and you don't need like super powerful microscopes. Um, one of the first experiences I had with adjusting nib tines was actually with a, a very expensive microscope that was used to um, do micro spot welding with. Obviously not everyone is going to have access to something like that. Uh, even myself, I don't have access to it right now. Uh, it's actually away, um, not in my apartment, but it's actually at my parents' place uh, because it's a very large thing. It came with its own bench, um, which actually happens to be the bench I use for my computer table. But, you know, that would be ideal. That would be really nice because you can work under magnification easily without having to hold anything, but that takes up space. Uh, so what I've gone with mainly is uh, handheld loops. Uh, I have a few here. You know, I have... Um, What's really commonly recommended, uh, especially um, Richard Binder, highly recommends this brand of loop. Uh, it's made by Belomo, uh, and this is happens to be a 10 times triplet. Um, I also have here, this is a relatively inexpensive loop. I think, it, I'm pretty sure it's made in China. Um, this is also a 10 times loop, but the nice thing about this is that it has a ring of LEDs on the bottom that really helps when you're trying to magnify small items. Um, the focal length of loops that are 10 times is generally around an inch. So that means like whatever you want to magnify and be in focus, uh, you need to have the item within like an inch of the lens. So that means that it's difficult for you to get it properly uh, lit sometimes, uh, especially with regular ambient lighting. Uh, so the LED loop is nice in that it provides a source of light so you can basically view anything under magnification uh, anywhere you want. Uh, one disadvantage about this is that it is a little bit bigger, as you can see, uh, just because, you know, it does have a battery compartment in it. Uh, they're both relatively heavy because they're glass and um, metal frames and everything. Um, in terms of the image quality, this is surprisingly not bad. I Honestly, I can't tell the difference in image quality between this LED one that I got <coughs> excuse me, from Amazon and this Beloma one. Uh, granted, that's Probably because this wasn't exactly the cheapest loop you can get. Uh, you know, on eBay, on Amazon, you can buy loops that, you know, promise various magnifications. Um, but the clarity of them is just not that good. And those loops are like $5, $10. This is actually $20 uh, versus the Belomo, which is uh, $30 or $35, depending on where you get it from. Um, so this isn't that far off in price from this. But this does have the added benefit of being lit, which is... Uh, a big positive, but the one that I carry around with me the most is actually this Beloma one. Uh, just because it's smaller, it fits in the pocket better. Uh, this is something nice for like a bag or, you know, keeping at home. You know, I tend to keep this in my, my uh, pen drawer here, uh, so I don't have to constantly go and look for this Beloma loop. Uh, what I also start off using was this. This is a Bosch & Lom, um, like eyepiece. Uh, this is the first one I was using actually in terms of loops. Uh, it's a seven times. Come on, focus, ah, whatever. Uh, and this is nice in that, uh, you know, it does have an eye cup here, so you can bring this up to your eyes um, and kind of squeeze it in place so that you can work with both hands. You know, these are handheld and you only have access to one hand while you're using it. Um, and then I, oh, I've also gotten one of these. Um, these are, this is like a very cheap um, head visor magnifier. Uh, I bought this kind of on a whim. It was only $8. I figured it'd be handy for when I was doing a lot of like nib work and stuff. Um, but honestly, the image quality on that isn't that great. I feel it's a little uncomfortable to use. Um, and I much prefer a handheld loop like this. You know, this is great and all, but uh, unfortunately, this is a seven times, so the magnification isn't quite enough. Um, I actually, as a minimum, I prefer 10 times. 
I also have, I, I keep a travel bag of my pen stuff here um, for if I'm adjusting nibs and whatever for uh, friends and away from home. I also do have this 20 times uh, triplet. Um, this was an inexpensive one, I think around $12 off of Amazon. This one, the image quality is not the best, um, and it's quite, it's very difficult to focus, but mainly because it's probably a 20 times loop and not a 10 times loop. This is great for when you have nib times that are very difficult to realign. Uh, you know, so basically how I would use this was, would be I would inspect the loop, and I would bring this to the side. You know, nice thing about these is that you could just kind of loop in your finger, do whatever you have to do in terms of uh, adjusting the nib. And then, um, you know, if I can't really see it that well with the 10 times, even though generally it's enough, then this 20 times is actually quite nice. Just, it's also good to see uh, final polishes. Uh, sometimes I'll grind nibs or whatever, or I feel like a nib, even though the, t the tines are lined, it still requires a little more polishing to smooth out. Uh, this is really good to kind of inspect the, um, the level of polish that's on the nib. But not that great for general nib work, just because it is very difficult to get it to focus well uh, and have a good image. You know, granted, you know, maybe if I had better glass, it would not be as bad, but I'd rather invest the money into buying better glass for something that I can use more often, uh, and the 20 times is just a little too much. Uh, now, why I consider magnification like loops um, most important is that a lot of times when people complain about a nib being scratchy, it has nothing to do with the level of polish. Uh, it's generally because the nib times are nib tines are out, out of alignment, and you know if you write with a heavier hand, it may not be a big deal because the tines will just you know if they're misaligned as you write and you put pressure down on the pen to the paper, they'll just align themselves. Uh, but if you write with a very light hand like me, any sort of tine misalignment you'll feel when you're writing. Um, especially so on cheaper papers, but even on smooth papers, if the times are just a little bit out of alignment, you'll feel it if you just write with almost no pressure. And you'll kind of feel it scratch against, you know, you'll feel that scratchy feedback in your fingers. So it does bother me. And in all honesty, out of all the pens that I've bought brand new out of box, I've yet to get one that had perfectly aligned tips, uh, perfectly aligned nibs. Uh, and this doesn't just extend, you know, this isn't just cheap pens, um, this also extends to more expensive pens. You know, I've, I've bought two Pelican M600 series pens, and those are not cheap pens, they're $300 and up. Um, but both of them had very poor quality controlled nibs. Uh, the polish was good, but I guess when the nib was assen assembled uh, into the section of the pen, the times would, ju would just get bent out of alignment. Uh, and, and you know, other pens that I've had that I've bought used, maybe they were worked on previously, so they're already pretty good. But in terms of new pens, I've yet to find one from any company that had perfect alignment yet. So, that's why I also feel it's important that instead of having to spend the $20 to, you know, 20 I think in general most uh, Nim Meisters will charge 20 to $30 for uh, time alignment and smoothing. Um, instead of spending that money and having to wait several weeks to several months, uh, it's just something that you can just easily do yourself as soon as you pen pull the pen out of the box, provided you kind of know what you're doing, which is uh, honestly isn't all that difficult, and you have proper proper magnification to help you see the work as you do it. Uh, when I do time alignments, I'm not aligning the tines under the magnification because I preferred handheld loops, but I can basically do a small adjustment, go back, check my work, and then adjust accordingly. And, you know, after a while, you just kind of get a feel for it. Um, so that's why most important. And also, honestly, um, with certain pens uh, like Pelicans where you can swap out the nibs, I find that no matter how careful you try to be when you unscrew and screw the nibs in, you always kind of bring the tines out of alignment. So, uh, and even with pens that have friction-fitted feeds and nibs, uh, like Pilot Pens, um, you know, when you pull the nib out of a Pilot Pen, it may look perfect, the tine slits may, may be really good, the tines may be aligned very well, but depending on how the nib is fitted together with the feed and inserted into the section, that can actually bring the tines out of alignment. So you do want to have to correct the tine alignment when everything is assembled together in the pen and not necessarily when it's outside. Uh, next up, you know, <clears throat> in terms of what I suggest for pen users is silicone grease. Um, this happens to be one I have here. Uh, a nice large two ounce tub of pure silicone grease. Uh, this is used for scuba gear, like lubricating O-rings and stuff. 
Uh, you can buy silicone grease in a lot of different places. Um, you know, plum like hardware stores that have plumbing sections will use it. Uh, you know, I also have like a small eighth of an ounce tub from uh, the Goulet's. And for most people, you know, something like this, which costs like two dollars, two hundred, uh, two fifty, uh, that'll last quite a long time, maybe even a lifetime. Uh, for me, I have more pens. I'm a little more anal about maintenance, so this is a nice investment for me. Uh, you know, this an eighth of an ounce for two fifty or two dollars versus this two full ounces for around ten dollars. So you know, that's always nice to have. Uh, and of course, if you've ever bought a Twisby pen, you'll usually get like a small. Uh, bottle of silicone grease. This is a more liquidy silicone grease um, and it's kind of difficult to get out of the squeeze bottle because this bottle is too small to really squeeze effectively um, and because of its consistency it's great for lubricating uh, pistons but not so much for converting pens into eyedroppers and sealing up the threads. Uh, for that you want something a little thicker like like this type of silicone grease. You know if I open it you can see it's a uh, it's quite thick and it like sticks onto the cap and uh, peaks up like that, almost like a, a meringue. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, and you do want to be careful when you buy silicone grease. Uh, you don't want to buy silicone caulk or anything, um, just because those are meant to solidify and seal. So you'll basically just bind up your piston or whatever you're lubricating. Uh, and you do want to be careful about the purity of the silicone grease you're buying. Um, if you you know if you ha like really have no choice, um, I, I would su highly suggest getting 100% silicone grease, just because it's pretty much inert and it won't react with any uh, rubbers or O-rings and stuff. Um, versus other uh, silicone lubricants may have other impurities in it that may do damage, may react ne negatively to ink. Uh, so you know you do want to keep that considered uh, under consideration. Um, third, I guess would be an ink syringe. Um, you know, I have pens that I use that are cartridge, uh, convert or you know, slash converter pens. I also have piston pens, but I feel like um, a syringe like this is very useful. You know, no matter what type of pens you have, uh, especially if you're really into buying ink vial samples that are like uh, two mil samples or whatever. Uh, this is very handy in helping you get out all the ink. Uh, or ink from like the very bottom of a bottle and filling up your cartridges or converters without having to necessarily dip that pen nib and section into a small vial of very little ink. Uh, and then I also recommend you have tools for disassembling your pen, uh, provided you know how to. Uh, most of the pens I own you can basically disassemble by hand, um, you know, and if you've bought a Twisby then th all the Twisby pens come with a Twisby wrench which is meant to help you unscrew their pistons. And then over here I have my very special Mont Blanc disassembly tool uh, which is <coughs> um, basically a paper clip. Uh, I don't see any reason why I should have to spend $90 to buy um, like a milled out Mont Blanc tool that people will sell where, you know, this paper clip that I got from work works perfectly fine. Uh, granted, this may require a little more finesse than an actual Mont Blanc wrench, but it still works. I've taken my 146 apart several times with this, uh, and I've taken apart my friend's 149 with this as well to help him um, clean and lubricate his piston. And then, I also recommend you get, not this pouch, uh, I mean, you can get this pouch if you want, um, but I rec recommend you get a few sample vials, uh, especially if you have, oops, I'll clean that up later. My pouch of converters just flew all over the place. Um, especially if you have pens that have interchangeable nibs. Uh, you see here I have a container filled with uh, Pilot and Lamy pen, uh, nibs. I also have um, an Edison nib in here, uh, and here's a, the, uh, the gold. M600 nib that came with my M600. Currently in my M600 I have a, I have swapped out for a medium M200 nib that I uh, stubbed. Which, honestly, I kind of feel like with the all black um, Pelicans, the, the full Monto nib looks really nice compared to the dual tone. A different topic altogether. Um, but, you know, these are great because they protect your extra spare nibs from damage. I don't really like these for carrying 
ink around because I feel they're a little fragile. Uh, they don't last very long versus something like a Nalgene bottle. But they're good for like short term ink carrying, um, you know, whether you want to give someone a sample of ink or whatever, but they're perfect for holding um, nibs and nib sections and all that stuff because they protect relatively well, well, they're pretty crutch proof and uh, they're large enough to fit a large variety of nibs. And then I also recommend um, Micromesh. Uh, you know, these are three different grits I have, uh, 6,000, 8,000, and 12,000. 12, um, this is something you do want to be careful with. Uh, even with the 12,000 grit micro mesh, you will wear away the tipping on your nib. Uh, so this is something a little more advanced, I guess. You know, stuff like the silicone grease, the loops, uh, that's easy. Anyone can have it. This, you want to be a little more practiced because you, you can do basically very expensive damage to your pen nib. Um, but it is very handy, especially the 12,000, you know, you can see here, the 12,000 is like the most used one, uh, just because this is, um, meant for like, very last moment general polishing, uh, versus the 8,000 and the 6,000 I use more for when I'm doing, uh, like a nib grind, and then I've got to polish from a, a lower grit to a higher grit, um, in order to get the nib nice and smooth. 12,000 is handy because, um, a lot of times what happens is even though the, Nib tines are aligned. Um, they may not necessarily be 100% aligned, but just so where you can't really actually see it with even under normal magnification. Uh, so this will kind of wear away the uneven, ever so slightly uneven tipping on it. Uh, and when you're doing grinds, it's also helpful to deburr some of the burrs that you get uh, in between the, um, the nib tines. And then finally, I recommend uh, you have some brass shims um this you see this is well worn um with brass shims you won't you can kind of use to help improve flow by increasing the um the width in between the tines but not necessarily so it's a little more complicated than that uh, you can do damage and bend it a little too much so i wouldn't recommend it um but i mainly use this to clean out feeds um especially on pens that I don't necessarily feel comfortable taking apart, you know, like Pelican nib units, I have not taken apart before. I'm not even sure if you can take them apart, uh, so that's why to clean the uh, the feed channel and in between the, uh, the tines of certain nibs, I just use a brass shim to kind of just floss in between it and get any either dried ink or um, like residual paper fibers out from in between it uh, to improve flow. So. Yeah, I mean, you know, this is basically kind of like just general maintenance stuff. Uh, this doesn't even involve tools that you would probably want for uh, like vintage pen repairs and stuff. Uh, this is just for simple, regular maintenance, you know, keeping your pistons or converters uh, nice and smooth, you know. Certain inks do kind of wear away at uh, lubrication. You know, I had a uh, Noodler's 54th Massachusetts in my M600, and I was using it constantly without flushing it for maybe three months, four months. Uh, every day, you know, it's not like I just let the pen sit there and kind of dry out or anything, but something in the ink kind of, like, washed away whatever silicone grease was actually in the piston, uh, and it basically stiffened up. And on a lot of my friends... Uh, fountain pens, he likes to use uh, Mueller's Lorraine Moth, which is an eternal ink, and he used that ink for years and never, either never really flushed it out or never opened up his pens to lubricate them or anything, and that piston was so tight, I honestly, I was a little concerned that uh, I would kind of like break the the spindle that goes with the uh, the worm the worm rod for the, uh, the piston, so general pen maintenance is definitely a good thing, especially if you want your pens to last long. And especially if you have expensive pens, you know, cheap pens, if they clog on you, if they bind up on you, you can always just throw them out and buy a new one. But once you get to pens that are several hundreds of dollars, that's a different story altogether. So I hope you guys found this video useful. Uh, I hope you enjoyed watching it. And thanks for watching.